Hi, welcome to Road to Vostok Develop episode 3. The main goal with this episode is to showcase my thought process and ideology around looting and how these looting systems, in my opinion, should be implemented to a hardcore survival game like Road to Vostok. This episode took a little longer to do because there have been a lot of development intensive deadlines for me recently. Even if no one knows about these behind the scenes deadlines, I think it's really important for a developer to maintain a positive rhythm, discipline and stick to these. There have also been a lot of positive things going on since the last devlog episode. I will share you some of these at the end of this video. But now let's talk about looting. In this episode I'm going to cover two main topics. These are loot architecture and loot ideology. The theme for this episode is going to be pretty technical, but I will try my best to explain these things. The purpose of this loot architecture chapter is to demonstrate how items end up in the game and how survival game projects like this is managed from the developer's perspective. I decided to add this chapter into this episode because developers don't usually discuss these topics publicly and even though players don't need this information, it's still a very important topic when it comes to scalability of the game. But first, to make things easier to understand, we basically need some sort of target item that we can track all the way through this process from databases to players inventory. For this purpose, I chose a Finnish national delicacy, pea soup, as our target item. In the game, this item is called canned pea soup and it belongs to category consumables. Now let's start tracking how this item ends up in the game and what processes there are along the way. The first phase is a cloud service or a server and the item database located in there. I personally use Google Drive but the service provider itself does not matter in this case. The purpose of these databases is to store all data related to items. The main reason why databases are used is the ability to edit data quickly and externally without a game engine. This image shows an example of the database category consumables and our target item can be soup and its data is displayed here. This example is a bit simplified for this video, but basically the data just contains the core information about our target item, such as file name, item name, abbreviation, item type, rarity level, item description, and item stats like volume, weight, and trading value. Once the item data is stored in the cloud, the next step is to convert the data to a format that is readable in the game engine. In this example, the data format that I use is called CSV, which comes from the words comma separated values. If we look at this data format, it's basically just comma separated text elements that can be read line by line. And here's our target item and its data. The next phase is probably the most technical of these, but the high level concept is still pretty simple to understand because it's just a matter of extracting the CSV file to the game engine. The official term for this next phase is CSV parsering, and for this purpose Road to Vostok uses custom middleware called database tool. This database tool is specifically made for this project and it's located inside the game engine. The tool reads the CSV file assigned to it and outputs the compatible item files to the game engine. This parsering phase is fully automated. The tool finds all the necessary files from the project and creates items directly to their correct loot tables for later use. If there's someone interested about the actual CSV parsering, here's a simplified code snippet for that. This code is from one of the old parsering systems I created for this game, but it's still very close to what I'm currently using. Now let's talk about our next phase, loot tables. Loot tables are basically just lists that contain different items. Items can be either manually preselected or directly generated and sorted through some item type category like in this case. And here's our target item, it has been sorted to consumables and all the item data from that CSV file is now fully usable inside the game engine. But there's one important thing to mention. Loot tables cannot be formed based on item types alone, they need to be individually configured and there should be some logical implementation method to form them. The implementation method varies between each game idea, but Road to Vostok uses main and subcategorization in order to form the final loot table inside the game. 
for example, a target item canned pea soup belongs to civilian main category and food subcategory. So the final loot table for this specific item is going to be civilian food. The specific loot table is used when for example a player is looking for food from civilian kitchens. The main idea here is to produce loot tables that are logical and maintain immersion and realism related to looting and scavenging stuff. The last phase on our loot architecture deals with the generation of the individual items. There are basically four different ways in the game to get a single generated item and each of these ways uses its own specific loot system. In this episode I will only go through the container and pickup based systems, because traders and quests need their own dedicated devlog episode at some point. Let's start with the container based loot generation system. If we look at this system, the first is the generation type, then there are container stats, container name, container limits, loot tables, loot buckets, a thing called rarity roll, amount rolls, also known as picks, and then finally those generated items. This system may seem a bit confusing, but hopefully it will open up when we start generating some items. If you notice, the civilian loot table is already pre-configured for the system, so we are ready to generate and roll the dice. When I press the generation button at the top, few things will happen. First, the system distributed all those loot table items by their rarity level and formed so-called loot buckets. This means that there are now two common, nine uncommon, 28 rare, and two extremely rare civilian food items inside the loot generation system. Another thing that happened was that rarity roll. In practice, this is only a matter of determining a random number between 1 and 100. This is also known as RNG, which means randomized number generation. The RNG logic itself is quite simple. If the randomized number is between 1 and 25, we have a chance to find an item inside the container. So in this case, the probability to find an item is 25%. And as for item rarity, the lower the randomized number is, the more rare item is generated. There are of course a lot of other little details behind this, but for this video I think this is enough to understand the core of this rarity role. So we got the number 32 from the first loot generation. The limit was 25, so this means no items this time. Let's try generating again. Number 72 this time. Still no luck for us. Let's generate again. This time we were lucky. We got the number 5 on the rarity roll. Let's see what happened. The first thing is that those container stats were updated and there's now 3 items inside the container. The loot generation system also calculated those amount rolls, which means how many items are selected in relation to their rarity level. Even though we got a good number from that rarity roll, these amount roll pick values were actually quite bad. These values indicate how many items can be selected from each loot bucket. In this case, we can pick one common item, one uncommon item, and also one rare item, because our rarity roll value was within that number 5 rare item threshold. One thing to notice is that our amount roll would allow to pick one extremely rare item, but it will not generate that, because our rarity roll value would have to be number 1. But in any case, Three items were generated for us from those loot buckets. These three items are in this case energy bar, can tuna, and our target item can be soup. This means that if a player finds this particular container inside the game world and opens it, he will find those items. Here's a demonstration. This container based loot generation was the first way and system to find a specific item in the game. Next, let's look at that pickup based loot simulation. This system is practically the same as the container one, but the generated items in this case are not UI based. They are generated directly as 3D objects in the game world. The main differences with this system are the simulation controls and simulation parameters which affect how items are generated in the world. For demonstration purposes, let's use those same three items that we already generated in previous example. When items are simulated by the system, a generation point is first created that uses those predefined simulation parameters. After the generation point, items are spawned, their location and rotation is randomized 
and they are placed in the world with physics. And here's demonstration for actually picking up those 3D items. For this pickup based loot simulation, it is important to understand that the simulation is dependent on the game world environment. This small example didn't take into account the 3D world and its colliders, but I will demonstrate this topic later on in this video. In summary, these were the key elements of the game's loot architecture. The goal here is that the developer is able to manage an item database externally without a game engine. This allows fast iteration, the ability to balance, update, and generate all the items in the game at once. For a survival game like Road to Vostok that will have hundreds of items in the future, I think loot architecture like this is a must-have solution. I think we can all agree that looting is one of the most important things to get right in a survival game. In my opinion, the first step is to understand the basics and as a developer ask yourself a question. What makes a fun looting experience? Although this question is rather subjective, it's still good to understand the key elements around this question. In many cases, the common mistake is to jump directly to programming of these mechanics, without actually thinking about their purpose in the big picture. There is this risk of getting into this tunnel vision, where you just focus on the code, and the actual purpose of the mechanic itself is then easily forgotten. In this loot ideology chapter, I will try my best to answer this main question. What makes a fun looting experience? I will definitely show some video clips of these mechanics which are in the game, but the main goal here is to brainstorm about the purpose of these looting mechanics. Let's start by introducing 5 key elements that serve as the main pillars for enjoyable looting experience. These are non-repeating patterns, intuitive mechanics, rarity and progression, storage solutions and bragging rights. Within each of these main pillars, there are five topics that are essential and linked to that developer goal mentioned at the bottom of each pillar. Unfortunately, in order to keep the duration of this episode reasonable, I'm not going to go through all of these one by one. But if you want to read all of these, you can pause the video here. For this episode, my plan is somehow to combine all of these into single keyword, which is easy to understand and which will answer our main question. What makes a fun looting experience? After thinking about this for a while, I would say that this one main keyword is scavenging, because if the theme of the game is post-apocalypse, scavenging is the most important and repeating action in the game. Now I'm going to brainstorm around this keyword and think about how it affects the whole looting experience. Let's start by going back to year 2013. I'm going to show you a small video clip of Daisy's first devlog video. The video clip is about a minute long, pay attention what the video is trying to demonstrate to the player. Hey, how can I even introduce this? Maybe I should just include this bit. Okay, I will. I think I will. I, okay, this is the loot spawning mechanic. A very basic idea of it. Essentially what I've done is I placed uh, some loot spawners specifically just for the little cans of beans that everyone will, who's played Daisy, the mod, will be very used to. One of the problems that we had in the mod was you'd just go around and you'd find these little piles of, of loot and you'd run into the building and see if there was a pile of loot. And if you didn't see any piles, you very quickly move on to the other building. So I wanted to get completely away from that and really make it feel like you were scavenging the environment. So we'll head inside this building and, and hopefully it gives a good idea of, of, of what I mean. So the idea is that loot can spawn like uh, behind an object, like you see this can here. Um, so it, you really have to qu get quite dynamic about looking around and trying to find, uh, trying to find the items. So it's really a, it's a totally different, um, you know, totally different experience. So I'll grab that because I, I really like my beans. So, um, yeah. So the the idea is that when you're going into these buildings, you're you're really going to have to have to scavenge and and, and find stuff uh, located in in really difficult to to find places. And someone might have come through and cleaned out most of a place, but might have missed you know something that spawned say behind the TV or something like that. So I really think it's it's going to add a lot uh, to the dynamic of, of... My take on what this video clip is trying to demonstrate is the phrase scavenging the environment, which basically means that you should actually find stuff rather than just seeing some obvious pile of loot in the middle of the floor. 
even though Dean Hall doesn't work for Daisy anymore. I think his initial thought process around scavenging was quite good already back in 2013. It has been almost 10 years since that devlog video. Based on that video, I decided to jump back into DayZ and test the current scavenging experience of the game. I played the game about half an hour and took a screenshot inside every house I entered. Now let's look at those screenshots. I want to start by saying that the original Armadue Daisy mod is one of the main reasons I started developing games. I'm one of the biggest fans of the game, I really respect the developers and I hope all the best for this game, but in all honesty, the looting experience in this game currently is pretty far from the phrase scavenging the environment. I know that Daisy is practically an MMORPG and there are server related limitations on the number and placement of items, but in any case, the looting experience remains exactly the level that the devlog video clip tried to avoid, meaning there's obvious pile of loot in the middle of the floor or then there's simply nothing to scavenge. Next, I will present my own solution on how to improve that scavenging experience. In that previous loot architecture chapter, I quickly showed how this pickup based loot simulation system works. Now let's take this system to slightly more appropriate environment and see how it can improve the scavenging experience. For this purpose, I made this simple example room to demonstrate this loot simulation system. When I add this simulation component to this room, the system automatically calculates the bounding box of the room so it can determine the median point and then assigns the generation point to that. Once the generation point is placed, the system goes through this simulation process like described earlier, but this time let's look at this simulation a bit more closely. When I press the generate button, items are spawned their location and rotation is randomized. In this example, let's use these white cubes first to make it easier to visualize. Next, I will press that simulation button a couple of times. Pay attention what happens when the simulation is now inside the room with colliders. If I want to change the behavior of the simulation, I can change the simulation parameters and for example add more force or change the gravity values. Now when these first steps are demonstrated, we can proceed directly to auto simulation mode which performs these previous steps automatically. This is what the auto simulation looks like in first person. Let's change these white cubes for some realistic items. We can for example use those canned beans what was used in the DC devlog episode. Now when the items have realistic dimensions, we begin to see how these items hide in the environment. This loot simulation system is one of my solutions to term scavenging the environment and how it could be approached in a hardcore survival game like Road to Vostok. This system is fully compatible with all the houses and buildings in the game and it's also randomized between different rooms. Some rooms may have this loot simulation component while others may not. The parameters of the simulation are also randomized and there may even be a situation where there are multiple different simulations in one big room. Next, let's talk about other things related to houses and scavenging. In my opinion, survival games should create these some sort of surprising situations in order to break out looting routines. Because if you imagine breaking into someone's house, it should involve something you aren't prepared for, because the house and its surroundings is totally unknown to you. I think one simple idea for making this surprise element is the randomization associated with the house entrances. I'm not going to explain all of this, but here's a couple of randomization options to illustrate this ideology.
A system like this is really easy to implement, and the randomization associated with the doors and windows alone bring that little surprise element to scavenging and looting routines. The last topic I want to discuss related to scavenging is interactivity. Here's another screenshot from Daisy. In terms of looting and scavenging, I think there's one problem in this image. The main problem is that nothing in this image is actually lootable. There's no looting related interactivity, so a player has no reason to look for anything. This topic is definitely a bit subjective, but in my opinion, survival games should provide players the opportunity to interact and search items from these container-like props, because in reality, they would be main storage places for items. One survival game that solves this problem perfectly is Project Zomboid. In Zomboid, there is a pickup system for individual items, but also this awesome container system, which basically allows everything that even remotely looks like a container and could store items to be interactive and lootable. I believe that more interactivity there is in the game, the more room it gives for immersion and freedom to enjoy the game world. For this reason, I have tried to mimic that Project Zomboid ideology where everything is interactive and lootable. Here's a few clips to demonstrate this. An important element that is also part of interactivity is physics and freedom to place items wherever you want. For example, the survival game The Long Dark allows you to place items under certain rules and conditions. This item placement system allows you to store and sell items visually, which is strongly linked to prepper culture and survival in general. In my opinion, this is an extremely important mechanic for a survival game. Here's one clip from the previous work in progress video to demonstrate this. I think system like this will provide pretty cool ways to decorate and customize your shelter for example. You can place items and weapons wherever you want without any restrictions. And to emphasize this, interactivity equals immersion and freedom. Logically, the next phase in this episode would be looting related UIs and inventory systems for example. But these are topics that will have their own devlog episode at some point so I think our loot ideology and scavenging journey ends here. However, if you haven't seen that first introduction devlog episode yet, here's that small video clip where I demonstrated the current UI and some basic looting. At the end of this chapter, I would like to mention that this was just the tip of the iceberg. The loot ideology and its elements that I have designed for this game contain some really unique stuff, but unfortunately these things didn't all fit into this one video. But I will definitely return to this in some other devlog episode. At the start of this video, I promised that there would be some positive news that I could share with you. Well, I've been a game dev teacher for the last 4 years. Working as a teacher has been a full-time job for me, which means that everything so far related to Road to Vostok has been done completely in my spare time, so basically evenings, nights and weekends. The drive to the school where I worked also took quite a bit of time. Practically every weekday for the past 4 years, I drove 75 km per direction, which means 150 km in total per day. 
this crazy daytime teacher, nighttime developer roller coaster for me ends now. Last time I resigned myself from the military, and this time I decided to resign myself from this teacher job. Starting from June 1st, 2022, I will work as a full time developer for Road to Vostok. There is always a risk in everything, but a project like this requires a bit of risk taking. And personally, this is a perfect time for me to do this. I consider myself a pretty productive person and I believe that this will create a lot of new opportunities for the project when I get to focus only on the game development for the first time in my life. The goal for this project remains the same as I described in that first devlog episode. I'm going to develop the best hardcore survival game out there and I don't see any obstacles for this goal. Thank you for watching and see you in the next episode. By the way, the next track you're about to hear is custom made for this game. Thank you.